Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and wait, welcome to the first of One Welbeck Women's Health Centre's special events. My name is Leslie Regan, um, and I'm a gynaecologist at the Imperial Group based at St Mary's, um, and I'm the medical director for uh, the Women's Health Floor, which is the newly opened sixth floor at One Welbeck. And I'm absolutely thrilled by the vision of what we're trying to create here at One Welbeck on the sixth floor. We've got a group of very, very specialist and diverse gynaecologists with all sorts of skills. We've got pregnancy experts and we've got a fabulous breast imaging and surgery team all located on the sixth floor. Wanting to provide the very best women's health packages that we possibly can for the women and the girls that we look after. But my colleagues and I were really keen not just to make this uh, seamless um, team with breast and gynaecologists, but also to do a bit of vertical integration up and down the building at One Welbeck. And so I think this is the first outing we've had uh, as a multidisciplinary team. And I can't tell you how much pleasure it's given me personally to get to know some of the other fabulous consultants in different specialties that are contributing to. Now, it's not a mistake that we've just got women here tonight. We're not excluding the men. There's some fabulous doctors who are men at One Welbeck. But for tonight, for our very first inaugural event, we thought it should be an all-female starring cast. And I'm going to introduce you to some of them in a moment. But what we wanted to do was to be able to see women on any of the different floors. And if we felt that they needed signposting to a different specialty, because that can often happen, that we then thought we had really had a fabulous network of people who would give the very, very best care to girls and women. I just hope that the boys are going to find a similar solution for the men's health as well. But we're you know, steering ahead or steaming ahead in the women's health agenda. And why is that important? Well, as you know, women represent 51% of the population, 47% of the workforce, and they undertake most of the caring responsibilities and they influence everybody else's health in society because of the influences they have with their family and their networks, their communities and society more widely. So I'm of the belief that when you get it right for women, everybody benefits. So as I say, this is the first of our webinars and we're going to, uh, we're very, very uh, pleased to be joined by Dr. Simrat Marwa, who's a GP in Chelsea, a very experienced GP. And she's very kindly agreed to come and help us with the live Q and A's uh, at the end of uh, the cases. And she's also, I think, contributed a couple of the cases that we're going to discuss. So, um, as I say, I'm a, an obstetrician and gynaecologist at Imperial. I got a particular interest in recurrent miscarriage um, and also uh, in uterine fibroids and menstrual problems, and also see quite a lot of women uh, with the menopause. But as I say, if you happen to deliver us to refer one of your patients to us and any of the people here tonight who feel that somebody else in our community at One World Bet could offer them better advice, you could be absolutely sure that that's what will happen. And we can reassure you that your patient will get the very best care. So with no further ado, I'm going to hand over to Simrat. Um, Simrat Marwa, the GP, would you like to just introduce yourself, Simrat, to, to our audience? Thank you very much, Leslie. So um, thank you for the introduction. And um, I'm based in Chelsea. General practice used to be my bread and butter. Um, now I'd say my area of expertise was more, uh, more regarding COVID intel. Um, and so I, um, it, practice has changed massively in the last year, not just for me as a GP, but for all of us across the board. And um, I've certainly had a lot less of doctor, is this the menopause? And a lot more of doctor, is this due to COVID? Um, so with the UK looking to get back to normal, um, I feel that we've got a great opportunity this evening to have a sit down with uh, some of the leading experts in their respective fields. We're going to refresh and more likely educate us further on a subject matter that is somewhat still feared by myself and um, a lot of my colleagues in general practice. So um, thank you very much for the introduction and this opportunity. And Leslie, just before we get stuck into the evening, we'd all like to wish you a very happy birthday and uh, thank you for taking time out of your day to uh, educate us. It's a great pleasure, Simrat. Thank you so much for being here with us. Now I'm going to pass over to my colleague, Lisa Weber, who's going to introduce herself. 
Thank you, Leslie. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Lisa Weber, and I'm a gynaecologist and a subspecialist in reproductive medicine. My particular areas of interest are disorders of ovulation, both the fertility aspect, but also the non-fertility aspect. So that means that the particular conditions that I tend to see the most of are polycystic ovary syndrome, which is what my research background was in. Um, but also when you, when you deal with a condition of plenty, you also tend to see a lot of, uh, of the opposite end of the spectrum. So I also see a lot of women who sadly have premature ovarian insufficiency. And I was the chair for the European human, um, uh, the, the chair of, of the ESHRAE, which is the European European Society for Human Reproduction and Embryology um, guidelines on the management of POI. Um, alongside that, I also see women with um, what I would call both uh, normal menopause who might be struggling with some of their symptoms. Um, and in addition, I see a, quite a bit and unfortunately rather an increasing amount of women who have um, functional hypothalamic amenorrhea. Thank you, Lisa. Can I pass over to Marilyn Drews? Hello, thank you very much and also good evening to everybody. Uh, my name is Marilyn Druce and I'm delighted to be part of this Women's Health Initiative, although I live not on the eighth floor with everybody else, but on the seventh floor as part of the One Welbeck Endocrine Group. Um, in my day job, I'm Professor of Endocrine Medicine at Barts and the London School of Medicine and Dentistry, where I really have a, a clinical interest in all aspects of specialist sort of non-diabetes endocrinology. Uh, from the common uh, to the extremely rare. Um, what all those conditions have in common is the need to think uh, holistically about all aspects of endocrine management. And, and my other passion and career drive relates to education, principally of doctors, but that of course feeds into a real wish to um, work closely with patients and making sure that they are empowered with all of the information that they need to make the best decisions in partnership with us about choices for their health. Uh, and I hope uh, that philosophy chimes with uh, everybody else in this group and I wish to bring all, all our different kind of perspectives to bear on, on helping women really with, with how they go forward with their health. Thanks so much, Marilyn. And I'm going to pass over now to Anna Wilson. Thank you, Leslie. Um, hi, my name is Anna Wilson. I'm a gastroenterologist and I'm at quite a few further floors down. I'm based at One Welbeck Digestive Health. Um, my day job, I'm a gastroenterologist at St. Mark's, which is a national bowel hospital and also Royal Marsden. And I have a particular interest in holistic women's health, including nutrition. But I also see a subset of patients who have got gastrointestinal problems following chemotherapy and radiotherapy, as well as surgery. And particularly women who've had treatment for pelvic um, cancers. I also have an interest in bowel cancer screening. I'm one of the nationally accredited bowel cancer screening colonoscopists, and we've got fantastic facilities down One Welbeck Digestive Health, where we're able to provide completely painless and seamless colonoscopy. And a fantastic thing about One Welbeck, of course, is interaction with all our other colleagues. And as everyone has emphasized so far, the ability actually to work with everyone else and direct patients to the right expert. Thank you so much, Anna. And now over to Lisa Das, last but not least. Thank you, Leslie. Um, I'm Lisa Das. I'm a consultant gastroenterologist also. Um, I'm based at uh, One Welbeck, second floor for endoscopy, seventh floor for, for clinics. Um, I have an interest in general gastroenterology, so encompassing all of the altered bowel habits, constipation, diarrhea, bloating. Um, but I'm also interested in celiac disease. Um, I'm also a bowel cancer screening accredited colonoscopist and I have an interest in early onset colon cancer and uh, Lynch syndrome which is um, more of the genetic hereditary type of colorectal cancer. I think it's really important a couple of days ago it was highlighted on the BBC about the, the uh, gender health gap and I think it's really important to empower our patients to find the right person to speak to about their health as that would be provide us the best outcomes I believe. Thank you so much, Lisa. And we're now going to move on to the first of uh, our, um, our cases. Um, and I'm just going to just briefly describe the case and just mention to our audience the investigations that have been done. And then you'll see in the discussion section of the slide, 
uh, some of the questions that have already been submitted to pose to our panelists and we're going to invite them to give different perspectives. And I hope that you will feel free to um, put your questions in the, in the Q&A session, uh, Q&A section rather of your Zoom uh, so that we can address those and Simrat will guide us through that towards the end. So this is case study one, a 47 year old Italian woman who in the last two years has noticed that her periods have changed. They used to last five days. Now they're occurring every 28, 30 days. She still has a period lasting five days but the length now varies quite significantly from as short as 20 to as long as 48 days in between the cycles. And this has been the case for a couple of years. She's not had any intermenstrual bleeding, but she describes herself as feeling lethargic, tired with brain fog and headaches, aches and pains in her body. And the tests that have been done for her so far, uh, she'd had some bloods done. Um, she's unsure of the date of her last smear, but it came back normal. And she knows that she needs to have a smear done in the not too distant future. Um, and she's been told that she needs to have some treatment for both vitamin D and iron deficiency. So as a gynecologist who sees a lot of women at this stage, um, my first thoughts are, is she perimenopausal? Um, but also, do, do we need to, uh, what, what do we need to do before we start embarking on um, therapies for her menopause if we confirm that that is the case? And one of the things I think we need to be very sure of here is that we've excluded any endometrial pathology. Although she hasn't had irregular bleeding, you still need to exclude it. And she would need to have an ultrasound mm -hmm. scan uh, to look at the uterine cavity carefully. She's described some quite classical symptoms of menopause. So she may have abnormal hormonal blood tests, FSH, LH, um, but she may not. Mm -hmm. um, because menopause isn't just an event that occurs one day. It's usually a process. So there's a whole lot of things there that one would need to do, I think, before we made a firm form diagnosis and there are a few things that we need to exclude. Lisa, is there anything you'd like to include in that or add to that from the gynecological point of view? Uh, yes, my thoughts are that in, in a case like this, really the, the diagnosis of, of menopause is almost one of excu exclusion, is there are a variety of um, You're muted, Lisa. I thought I was unmuted. Hopefully I'm unmuted now. Um, what I was saying is that um, I feel in a case like this, uh, making a diagnosis of perimenopause uh, really should be one of exclusion and that one needs to look for other conditions that could also be presenting um, with a sense of lethargy, um, not being able to think clearly, headaches and general aches and pains, although all of these things can be symptomatic of low oestrogen. And one of the things I wanted to highlight with this case is that actually measuring gonadotropins isn't always terribly helpful. As Leslie's already said, um, perimenopause is a, is a process. So what things look like on one day don't necessarily reflect what they're like at other points, um, should you have, have, uh, have checked bloods on another day. And I think my main point is that it would be very normal um, to find elevated FSH, LH and a low estradiol or indeed elevated gonadotropins, but perhaps a high estradiol in a woman around the, the perimenopause. And that's because the way in which follicles grow is abnormal. So there will be cycles when she might start to grow um, two or three follicles. She might even actually ovulate two or three follicles. Um, uh, or it might be a time when she's having a longer gap in between her cycles when actually no follicles grow. So it's very normal to see um, some quite large swings in both the estradiol and the progesterone level, but also just picking up an elevated FSH in a woman in her late 40s um, really is, is what one would be considered normal um, for someone um, of that age. Thanks Lisa. Now from our gastroenterology colleagues or our endocrine colleagues, who's going to chip in a different perspective? So I chip in uh, just a couple of uh, general points, and then I'm sure the gastroenterologists have got some things to add. But um, one of the things that's quite useful at this time, I think, which is sort of hinted at in the discussion points a bit, is that as well as the problem that this lady has come with, I mean, essentially her presenting issue relates to she's anxious about her periods and also she's got some um, cognitive symptoms. It's also an opportunity. This is a time, particularly with menopause, much more in the popular press. It's in features on Sunday papers. There's lots of articles in women's magazines. 
it's it's an opportunity to work with someone on some of these um, perhaps um, myths that they bring at around this time. Uh, and this this lady may have come with an assumption that she is perimenopausal or menopausal. With that, that may come some assumptions from her that, for example, she doesn't need contraception anymore, whereas in fact she really does. Her chance of conception is low, but not nil. And even if she does start some HRT, that's only adjunctive to any estrogen that's declining. It's not really bringing its own contraceptive value unless she also has the Mirena coil put in. So it's a, a useful opportunity for discussions about contraception, what's desired and what's optimal for her. And just also picking up in the discussion points, one of the other misconceptions that uh, is perpetuated a little bit by what people, what people read at the moment is not only their anxiety about should they or shouldn't they use HRT, but th their thoughts about uh, what they've read about bioidentical hormones and natural remedies and uh, whether these are better or more suitable or kinder. And it's a useful time to remind ourselves that uh, body identical, which is hormones that look like the ones we make, is not the same as what uh, people who market bioidentical mean, uh, which uh, essentially are made in a lab to personal specification, but not necessarily to good manufacturing practice and not tried or tested in randomised control trials with appropriate safety data around them. So it's, it's a useful kind of educational moment around what's going on physiologically and some, some long-term health planning as well as managing the symptoms that are kind of on the on the face of it, the presentation. Thanks, Sarah, and a very good point about that, because it's very difficult to do a, a lot of my clinics without meeting somebody who's worried about HRT because it's not natural, and they think that the bioidenticals are. And as you've so, clever, uh, so clearly said, Marilyn, that's not necessarily the case at all. So on to the gastroenterology side of things. Anna. Thanks, Leslie. So I suppose as gastroenterologists, what, what we get, would pick up is this sort of patients who are feeling very lethargic with brain fog and, and headaches, which does go in often in line with some of the functional um, gastrointestinal symptoms. And I think obviously I would want to know a bit more. Has she had any change in, in her bowel habit? Is there anything else to look out for? Because, of course, she's approaching at the age where the incidence of more significant thing increases. Um, I was interested in the sort of blood test that she's had done and of course the things that we would normally do in our practice would be to look at things like not only just hemoglobin level but of course ferritin in parallel to that to prove that she really did have true iron deficiency anemia but also if she's feeling really lethargic and has a brain fog you'd obviously want to have a look at other vitamins including vitamin b12 and I noted that she's low in vitamin d. It's an interesting point about how far you invest her vitamin, her iron deficiency, if she really is truly iron deficient. Of course, it's all down to the history. If this is a lady who has previously had very heavy periods and has been on and off iron deficient for years, on and off iron, then you could be more relaxed about there being an additional gastrointestinal cause. However, if this is very new, she's never previously had it in the absence of change of diet, and particularly if there are any bowel symptoms, then she would warrant investigations of the gastrointestinal tract, depending, and you would be guided by the symptoms. Obviously, you would worry more in terms of the colonic pathology. If she's got lower GI symptoms, you'd want to do a celiac screen to make sure that she doesn't have celiac disease as cause of iron deficiency anemia. And of course, endoscopy, if she had any upper GI um, investigations, in terms of vitamin D, we know that most people in the UK need vitamin D supplements from about September to May time. And therefore, definitely once she's treated, she also stay on maintenance after that. And then a bit of vitamin B12 absorption decreases as we get older. It's particularly important around perimenopausal area. And so we know that she may need some vitamin B12 supplements if they were to be found to be low. And that may help with some of the lethargy. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and of course, there's um, one of the questions in the chat, and I'm not trying to take over your role, Simrat, is what about ruling out hypothyroidism, which is another uh, factor that could well uh, have accounted for this real change in menstrual function. And so could you try and fibroid. So there's all sorts of things for us to be thinking about. Lisa, did you want to add anything, Lisa Das, to this from the GI point of view before we move on? I think the only other thing is that the lethargy, brain fog and musculoskeletal aches could also be due to um, irritable bowel syndrome, which Anna already mentioned. And, you know, regardless of her symptoms, uh, I think she does need both thyroid function and the celiac serology checked. 
uh, just to echo that. Simrat, anything else you'd like to add from the GP point of view or any questions that you might have picked up? Just one question on this. So this was this was my case and, and we had extensive floods and uh, this lady started on HRT, but um, she, had, she had asked me about bleeding every two months instead of having a bleed with her HRT every month. And um, I managed to find some HRT um, and there was one brand where you could have a bleed every two months instead of a monthly bleed. And a lot of people that I spoke to about it didn't know um, there was HRT where you could have a two monthly bleed as, a, as opposed to a monthly bleed. So can you just uh, give me your opinion on that? And um, is it something that we see commonly in practice? Yes, yeah, certainly it's a very, very much an option. And I see a lot of women who don't want to have a bleed every month. And of course, uh, at a later stage in their lives, in their fifties, they may not need to have any bleeding at all. Um, one of the other ways that one can protect the endometrium without uh, is also to put in a Mirena device as well. And I think that's a very, an increasingly popular option with many, many women, particularly with the heavy periods uh, that this woman is likely to have had, because as you know, the Mirena will reduce the amount of bleeding. It may not get rid of it completely in a 47 year old, um, but it's certainly probably going to reduce it. So you will be um, you'll be treating two, two problems there with a Mirena device, which would give her endometrium very good protection. And then you could give her um, transdermal estrogen, which has probably got the, the lowest side effect pro uh, profile of them all. And she may not need to have some bleeding. Lisa, is there anything else you want to add on about um, sequential uh, preparations? Yes, um, I think I think you're right, um, Zimra, is that it's often forgotten about that you can actually give um, cyclical bleeds up to every three months. Um, there's a very, very small increased risk of um, endometrial cancer with the um, with the, the, the prolonged cycling. Um, and if you are uh, uh, giving giving the progestogen every three months, um, then it, it should be for a minimum of 12 days. Um, the other thing I'd say is that in a woman who's actually still got her cycle, you may find that um, giving it um, every two months or every three months, you might just end up with some irregular bleeding. It doesn't actually do any harm, but then you end up chasing your tail a little bit. And is this irregular bleeding some endometrial pathology that I need to be worried about? Or is this just a bit of spontaneous ovarian activity? So I, I generally, if, if I'm starting HRT on someone who's got this sort of cycle length sort of from the 20 to 48 days like like this lady is is I, I would if she doesn't want bleeds I'd probably go down a marina route um, or I would have her on a, on, a, on a monthly preparation I do quite a bit of so-called DIY HRT that doesn't come out of the packet um, particularly if you if you have a lady who either you have recommended or she particularly wants to have a natural progestogen um, because actually uterogestan is, is pretty good in that situation and then you can of course ask her um, uh, to, to take it how you want it to be rather than something that comes off the shelf so I do think it's a good good idea to bear that in mind uh, particularly when you're dealing with a woman who is um, post-menopausal and, and um, may not uh, want to be completely bleed-free, because certainly there are women who would prefer to continue to have some form of, of, of uh, vaginal bleed. Thanks, Lisa. Um, I think if there are no more further questions, Simrat, we should move on to case two, because as I predicted, we've all got very enthused about this case, and it might, we might not be able to get, all through, get through all four of them. But can we move on to case two, please? And I'm going to pass over to Anna and Lisa Das to take us through this one, please. Thank you, Leslie. So case two, a 46 year old lady, P2G1, with a Mirena in situ for three years, and she's had intermittent lower abdominal cramping. Her investigations included the Mirena being removed and her blood test showing an FSH 44, LH 15, with estrogen of 60 and uh, testosterone zero, less than 0 0.4. So she's been started on the following medications, which include utrogestrin at that dose, estrogel two pumps daily, and tostran 2% on alternate days. So just looking at it from a, a gastro standpoint, we're thinking about the lower abdominal cramping, and I can see Later on, it shows us that she's had a normal, abdom a normal abdominal pelvic ultrasound and colonoscopy, which I'm quite clear to hear, uh, quite happy to hear about. She is approaching the age of increased risk of colorectal cancer. Um, and we know that this is slightly higher in men until the time of menopause. And then after that, women uh, have the same kind of risk also. 
The other thing is she's had a DEXA scan showing mild osteoporosis. Her vitamin D levels are adequate, uh, estrogen levels adequate, but an abnormal DEXA would again encourage you to think about uh, celiac screen testing uh, as is currently recommended by the mm. NICE guidance even without any symptoms. Perhaps Leslie, could you have a have a look at the question about the low libido and uh, whether you would give this routinely? Well, I think I think the story about the way uh, testosterone is is complex, and and it's it's also been um, it's been a it's a topic that people had very um, polarized views about. I think um, uh, oft, often not very evidence based either. So I think that what I would probably do is give her some tester gel with, and see whether she responded, i.e. a trial run with tester gel to see whether she responded to it and improved it. And if it didn't, then to stop it. Um, Anna, are there any points that you'd like to in, uh, contribute to the, from the GI point of view? Um, well, uh, similarly to Lisa, I was rather relieved that she's had a sort of investigation done in terms of a colonoscopy and, and her left iliac fossa pain. And, and I really think that, you know, from a gastrointestinal point of view, if these are normal, it's very unlikely that she's going to have a, um, a significant uh, GI pathology as a cause of a uh, low abdominal cramping. Of course, she's a bit young to have diverticulosis. That's what we commonly see, left iliac fossa pain and a crampy abdominal pain. Um, but in absence of any specific bowel symptoms or bloating, um, probably nothing else from our point of view um, and I think you know obviously defer to you in terms of the uh, gynecological symptoms. So one of the things I think a lot of people might want to know about was because she's got borderline osteoporosis and she's already taking uh, estrogen replacement should we be adding anything in any other pharmacological agents to, to thinking uh, to protect her bones further? Lisa would you like to Lisa Weber would you like to address that one? Yes, I mean, I certainly think she should be um, looked at from the point of view of osteoporosis outside of this all necessarily be being due to low oestrogen. Um, she's had a marina in um, for three years and I'm assuming that she was amenorrheic with it in. So we don't really know what her menstrual pattern is like. And we don't actually have any information about um, what, what happened when the marina was removed with regard to her menstrual pattern, whether she remained amenorrheic or not. And as I said with the previous case, um, having an FSH of 44 uh, isn't proof of, of, of menopause because there's many women who are having regular periods who will have FSHs of, of 44 and indeed higher. So you can't use the FSH to predict what's actually happening in terms of um, uh, uh, the ovarian function. Again, this is sort of a, a fairly normal finding for a woman of the age of 46. So um, it might be that one can track back when her menopausal symptoms actually started. Um, it could be that actually when you inquire that around about the time that the marina went in, um, sort of shortly after that, she might have been starting to develop um, hot flushes. These may have shown a cyclical pattern or not. Um, but of course, many women will have, um, have you know, even a, a barn door symptom such as hot flushes or, or night sweats on a cyclical basis, but still be, um, still be cycling on a regular basis. Um, so I think it would be important to actually look for other things that could be causing um, the osteoporosis. And we've heard we've heard about some of them. Another thing that I'd be thinking of um, might be to sort of have a look at a parathyroid hormone, for example. Um, but I don't think one can just assume uh, that her, her, her borderline osteoporosis is is purely driven by um, potentially low estrogen um, well, in terms of. Sorry. So no, I was just going to say, in terms of other Sarah things, to, to, to make a comment about that, would you want to make it from an endocrine point of view, Marilyn? Uh, about the osteoporosis. Mm. And also Lisa's point about the parathormone. Yeah. So, well, I think there's, there's we, we can take it in sequence, if you like. The first bit is what, what was the indication for doing the DEXA scan? And to an extent, a lady of this age, unless she's got a risk factor for osteoporosis, doesn't necessarily automatically require um, a DEXA scan sort of just to see, uh, because actually the chance of significant osteoporosis is quite small. I guess in her case, the issue is rather more that because we she's been amenorrheic for the last three years, we can't say whether in fact she's sort of had an officially premature menopause or not, which would count as uh, a reason for having a look at her bone density. Having seen her bone density is on the low side, um, by, by borderline osteoporotic, I'm going to guess it really falls into the osteopenia category. It's a good opportunity 
to look for things that might be driving that. Her vitamin D level is important. Lifestyle factors are really important. Her previous menstrual pattern is really important, but maybe she takes no weight bearing exercise at all, for example. Maybe that's something that needs to be remedied. Maybe she drinks a lot of alcohol that needs to be remedied. Maybe she's a heavy smoker. That's a really important thing that she could address. Um, undoubtedly, it's a useful opportunity if someone has unexpected low bone density to think about two things. One is whether they've got asymptomatic hyperthyroidism. So even if that's compensated and subclinical, it pulls calcium out of the bone and makes the bone thinner than it should be and increases the risk of fracture. And the other is asymptomatic hyperparathyroidism. But the catch is not to do that test at the same time as um, the vitamin D. It's only of value if you know that the patient's calcium is elevated and the vitamin D is normal because otherwise all you say of the high PTH is that it's an appropriate physiological response to the low vitamin D. It's only relevant in terms of diagnosing hyperparathyroidism if the calcium is elevated. You might of course pick up unexpected renal failure or any other kind of contributor. And then the third bit about the borderline bone uh, and the question sort of addresses this is, do we need to do anything therapeutic as well as anything preventative? And I'm, I mean, I'm sure you know that DEXA on its own doesn't give you enough information about fracture risk and the best way to think about it is to plug the DEXA finding into something like the FRAX score for which you can find a tool online if you want to that sort of looks at this in the context of the wider picture the other risk factors such as family history personal history of fracture um, things of that nature also takes into account her BMI because if her BM, her BMD can be low without her fracture risk being high enough to need any additional intervention at this stage, other than just appropriate prevention. Thanks very much, Marilyn. So as you can see, audience, are a wealth of different ways to go about, about it. Um, Simrat, any other comments that you'd like to make? Oh, no, I think we've, we've covered a lot of ground. Um, so I don't have any questions and I don't think uh, anyone in the audience does either. So... If we're all happy with that, um, shall we move along to the next one? Okay. Lovely. So this is case study three, and I think Anna, you're going to kick us off with this one, aren't you? Yeah, I am. I think I think this case was um, submitted by Lucy Allen, one of our biofeedback practitioners, a one Welbeck, um, who's fantastic and we work very closely. With her. But it's a very typical patient uh, that we would normally see in gastro clinic of this age. Is a lady in her fifties who has had a two-year history of bowel urgency and faecal incontinence, which is worsening, and especially when out walking, which is obviously having an uh, impact on her uh, quality of life. In terms of her obstetric history, she's had two children, both normal vaginal deliveries, forceps, episiotomy and perineal tear, and her period stopped around the age of 50. And she's also experiencing some other side effects, including dyspareunia, reduced libido. And she's got loose bowel movement, type five, and it's got a good diet, no suggestion that she's had any change. And Lucy's very kindly put some discussion points for us and, and um, investigations that she thinks we, we normally do be, before sending them to her. And I'll invite Lisa Das in a moment to, to join me and discuss some of these. But I suppose a really crucial thing here is, has there been a definite change in bowel habit? And by that, we mean, has there been change in consistency and frequency? Because, of course, you can get fecal incontinence without necessarily the change of consistency. And that is often a, just a pure pelvic floor issue. But it's really important to work out if there is a reason why that bowel habit has changed. She's now over 50. There's increased risk of colorectal cancer and other pathology. So it is really important that we exclude uh, an organic cause uh, for her bowel habit change and um, as ever we want to do our usual things that we do in any gastro clinic in patients with diarrhea making sure that all her bloods go off and particularly celiac disease and thyroid function tests and interestingly I, I listened to a talk the other day from a very senior gastroenterologist who said that he'd never ever picked up hypothyroidism in his entire career um, of sending these tests off I actually have to say I, I had it on my first of tertiary patient who was referred to me after pelvic uh, radiation disease that's the only one ever but you know I think it's obviously worthwhile doing colonoscopy is the sort of next thing that we would do and the, the good you know the advantage of colonoscopy is that your gastroenterologist can assess your perianal area at that point and we do this very loose sort of squeeze test it's a sort of poor men's anorectal physiology but it actually gives you a really good sensation of how strong the pelvic floor is both in terms of internal and external sphincters 
um, once you've sort of established there is no other pathology, then we move on to a bit which is what Lucy really is focused on, which is the sort of anorectal physiology and endoanal ultrasound. I think doing endoanal ultrasound is incredibly important because there are certain damages of internal and external anal sphincters that can be surgically repaired and it's worthwhile thinking about it. We often don't think about it enough. But in terms of anorectal physiology, it's really quite important to work out what part is not working quite well. And for some of these patients, it doesn't sound like it's this lady, but the patients who find it very difficult to evacuate, for example, um, I mean, she has a small rectus seal and interception, it's defecating proctogram that's really important. And then we're actually able to see what happens to the pelvic floor as the patient um, empty their bowels. Um, in, so in terms of sort of further treatment from that, I will, my, my tendency tends to be to treat these patients very holistically. And it, unless you've found an obvious pathology, you need to work with them both in terms of their diet, both in terms of their psychological state. So this lady is, there's a huge anxiety over the symptoms and partly there will be reassurance provided by a normal investigations. But nevertheless, that of course makes the gut symptoms much worse. And we've all experienced that, you know, the butterflies in their tummies, when people get anxious and worried, the gut symptoms get worse. Um, so there's a huge amount that can be done in terms of diet, bulking up the diet, um, and then by a feedback, which Lucy um, concentrates on. I might ask Lisa to, to stop me talking. I could talk about this forever. As you can see, I do an awful lot of it, but I might ask Lisa Das to come in on this. So, so I do, I'm not just listening to my voice, just to maybe uh, give her opinion on sort of dietary interventions and, and how she would uh, take managing this patient before sending it to Lucy. Thank you, Anna. So I think it's really important. I mean, this lady has actually, you know, come ahead, come forward with the faecal incontinence story. But often I find you've got to ask directly, has there been soilage? Have you missed, go you know, weren't able to reach the toilet? Because it's something that people are quite embarrassed to talk about. And uh, the other thing to mention is that, you know, you get overflow diarrhea from constipation and constipation is the change that happens around the peri perimenopausal um, time because of the reduced estrogen and the reduced motility within the gut. So just the dietary changes that you would start with would, you know, initially be with, you know, perhaps adding some soluble fiber with fiber gel, making sure she's drinking plenty of water and taking exercise. Um, and we really need to know, is this overflow diarrhea or actually, you know, is this diarrhea per se? It sounds as though we've, we've excluded microscopic colitis and any other, any other pathology going on. The other thing to mention is that IBS increases after um, menopause too. And these women have a higher um, physical reduction in their quality of life because of the IBS. We know now that the gut microbiome is playing quite a big role in um, menopausal symptoms, but also the IBS related to menopause. And there are some studies, um, not many, which show that some probiotics may be beneficial in um, helping some of these symptoms. Um, so one in particular, VSL number three, has been shown to have um, decreased bloating and decreased abdominal pain. But again, further studies need to be, need to be used. The other thing is that anxiety and depression go along with this period of life too. So perhaps addressing those factors and low dose uh, tricyclics or SSRIs may be beneficial in addition to restore that quality of life. And Lisa, if I may just ask you in terms of probiotics, because I wonder whether our GP colleagues would be very interested because obviously there's a whole thing about VSL3 and being prescribed whereas probiotics that you can buy over the counter. It's, you know, I tend to use Simprove a lot, but that's a lot more expensive. And there's a huge, obviously, multi-billion dollar industry regarding probiotics. What are your personal choices in terms of when you're recommending probiotics to patients and indeed advising GPs? So I personally, I mean, obviously, as you said, you know, people are making a lot of money out, out of probiotics. But we have to understand that probiotics are these live um, microorganisms and they need to survive to get to the small intestine and proliferate and if you look at the the studies done they're don't, done mostly on Simprove and VSL number three as you know so a lot of the over-the-counter probiotics are actually neutralized by the hydrochloric acid in our stomach so actually we're spending a lot of money on not a lot and um, so I tend to use either VSL or Simprove. Simprove has the um, disadvantage somewhat of having to be kept in the fridge so you can't Tra travel around with it, whereas Simprove, um, whereas um, VSL number three comes in tablet and package form, so you can actually travel with it. Um, VSL 
has been shown to have quite good effects also coming back to the osteoporosis discussion earlier for um, reducing the kind of bone loss that happens with um, the perimenopausal period. So I know more studies have to be done on that, but I would use either Simprove or VSL um, as a recommendation once I'm seeing a patient with these significant symptoms. Um, I have a question. So um, this would be for Leslie and Lisa Weber. Um, one of one of the participants has asked, would it be worth investigating or ruling out endometriosis? Well, interesting, interesting question. In my experience, endometriosis that is extensive and causing bowel um, disturbances usually has a cyclical pattern. But of course, this woman's 52 and she stopped her periods at the age of 50. So, yes, it is a possibility. Um, I don't I don't think it, it fits together with this because most most endometriosis is going to calm down post menopause. Um, but Lisa, do you have a Lisa Weber? Do you want to add into that? Um, I was going to say the same thing, actually, is that um, if this is a, a, a new presentation of, of bowel disturbance that's come at a time when actually endometriosis should be calming down. Um, although endometriosis can continue to be a problem after the menopause, it gradually should be getting less and less because, of course, it's kept going um, by the hormones of the menstrual cycle. So I think it's unlikely to be um, uh, endometriosis related unless actually when you drilled into it, there was perhaps a past history and, and, and maybe the pain is something that is um, that's been a feature for a long time. Um, the point that I was going to raise was that this lady has a number of reasons for um, having um, uh, uh, painful intercourse and, and low libido is one she's she's going by the sound of it she's going to have lost quite a lot of her self-confidence because of her very distressing symptoms that she's been having but also she's been describing um, uh, vaginal dryness and, and, and vaginal atrophy, atrophy was seen on on the examination so um, I was thinking along the lines of um, uh, thinking that she probably ought to have some topical estrogen um, vaginal estrogen can be very helpful um, but actually I mean her symptoms are quite severe and, and and um, there are oestrogen and progesterone receptors in, in many other parts of the body, not just um, the pelvic organs and, and the breast, there's in the brain and also in, in, in the gut. And I wonder whether she might actually um, feel better, at least in the short term, with some systemic HRT as well as some um, local HRT. Um, I think the important thing is once this lady's been fully investigated, hopefully we can make her feel better. And then sometimes if you start with systemic HRT and vaginal HRT, and then you can gradually sort of remove the layers. And it may well be that in the longer run, she, 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 she might be happily managed with just um, topical uh, vaginal oestrogen. Perfect. Our, our audience will clearly get the message. We're, we're all women physicians who think the world of HRT. <laughs> I'm going to turn now to, to Marilyn, please, to take us, if there are no other questions, Simrat, for this one. No, I'm going to ask us to move, up, move us on to take us through question four, or case study four. Yep, of course. So case four uh, is that of a 53-year-old woman who had her menopause at the age of 47. She'd been symptomatic at that time with classical vasomotor symptoms. She was given oral cyclical HRT with a regular bleed. She has now been having that for some years, doesn't find it particularly burdensome. Uh, she comments she has a little facial hair growth that's new and she finds this upsetting. And although she no longer has any hot flushes, her libido is not as good as she would like. Um, so a, a fairly typical history, I imagine, that walks through clinic uh, much of the time. Uh, in terms of uh, other aspects of her health, she's overweight with a BMI of 26. There's a family history of hypertension and type 2 diabetes mellitus, although she herself uh, does not appear to have either of these. She's a non-smoker who drinks one to two units of alcohol a week. And I guess um, uh, uh, it'd be good to open with two things, really. Just before we talk about the principles of how to manage the management she's currently getting, it's worth thinking under investigation about whether she does need any additional investigations here. And certainly not from the point of view of diagnosing her menopause. I know Lisa was talking earlier about when and when it is not useful to uh, measure things like FSH and LH, but actually she stopped her periods five years ago. There's no reason to suppose now that this is anything other than menopause and she's been symptomatically benefiting from oral HRT. Um, she may, it may be a useful opportunity to consider, given that she has risk factors for metabolic syndrome, uh, whether there are any features in her blood tests that are relevant to this. And that's important, both in terms of um, 
uh, health prevention, but also in terms of uh, what's appropriate and safe with respect to her treatment. But one of the questions I guess that was raised for me is that she's got some new facial hair growth and to what extent that requires investigation. It's not uncommon to see it at the time of the menopause, when should you worry? And it's not uncommon to see it at the time of the menopause because of course your estrogen drops fairly rapidly, your progesterone drops fairly rapidly, but your testosterone kind of drops off relatively gradually over years. It doesn't fall off a cliff at the time of the menopause, which means that that together with if there's been some weight gain, a drop in her SHBG means there's some free androgen knocking about and a little bit of excess hair growth therefore is fairly typical, may not mean, require any investigations. Times to worry are if there is genuine, if it's rapid, if it's progressive, if it's more extensive than you might expect to see, so if it's on the chest, if it's on the back, uh, if it's associated with other virilizing features like clitoromegaly or male pattern baldness, those are times where it's really important to not forget that there are other reasons for hyperandrogenism at the time of the menopause. History is also important, so if in fact when you go back in time there was some hyperandrogenism before the menopause, it's not uncommon for it to just kind of be highlighted. So for example, PCOS or congenital adrenal hyperplasia sometimes don't show up until this time, simply because of that imbalance with the estrogen and testosterone, unmasking them at this point, even though someone's been putting up with mild symptoms for a long time. But more significant progressive virilizing symptoms need to put you in mind of uh, an, an adrenal focus or an ovarian focus for inappropriate androgen secretion. And those kinds of things really do require some further evaluation before deciding um, on whether there's a pathology that needs managing. It's also important to think about it because when we think about the principles of her HRT, which I'm sure uh, Lisa uh, Weber is gonna be keen to comment on, but she's around the time that she might be thinking about say, well, it, for, for metabolic reasons, we might be thinking about moving to transdermal rather than oral, but this might also be a time for thinking about continuous rather than sequential. So the progestogen component's gonna be important, but if she's, some of those are androgenic, and if she's thinking about managing her libido and testosterone is on her mind, that's also going to exacerbate some of these androgenic symptoms. So it's, it's important to think about this firstly from the point of view of not missing an important pathology, and secondly from how it might impact on your choices for her treatment. And I imagine, although I'm happy to talk about this um, forever, um, I shall hand over to somebody else, maybe uh, Lisa Weber, to talk about the options for her specific HRT. Thank you, Mariam. Um, yes, I, I think I would be nervous of, of writing this off as just being sort of a normal um, uh, uh, experience of the menopause um, in, in, in a woman who perhaps had never had any form of androgenic symptoms before. Um, but certainly that mild PCOS type pattern can become more apparent around the time of the menopause because you've got the big drive of, of raised FSH and LH on the theca cells that are still going to be within the ovary and that, that will be quite happy to produce some testosterone. The things I would be thinking about for her from the point of view of HRT would be to remove any um, unnecessary um, androgenic drive that there might be within her HRT for the unwanted hair growth. Um, and if she's on an oral preparation, which she's on at the moment, she's likely to be on something like a less duet. Um, and that contains norethisterone. And norethisterone is, is probably the most um, androgenic of the progestogens that we have. So getting her onto something less androgenic um, might be beneficial for, for trying to remove some of um, that, that drive. Um, if she was going to go on to something transdermal, it is um, uh, there's, there's, uh, she could go on to um, a natural progesterone. Um, so again, that's uterogestan. And I think that, as Mariam um, alluded to, perhaps moving her on to a, a continuous combined regime, whereby she can have a steady state of a lower dose of a progestogen rather than having the, the those peaks. In someone whose end organ, someone whose skin is sensitive to androgens, I think if you can try and keep the, the 
the, the drive to a minimum. So although the area under the curve is going to be about the same, I think that they can benefit from it being a steady state rather than having um, peaks and troughs. Um, and there are other things that she could be thinking about as well to remove some of the androgenic drive, which would be with weight loss. Um, if she can lose some weight, her SHBG is going to go up and that's going to mop up a bit more of the free testosterone. Um, from the point of view of giving androgens for um, poor libido, I think this lady's not going to enjoy um, taking some extra androgens at all. I think she'll find that the um, unwanted um, uh, uh, facial hair that she's got may well be driven by it. Um, I think it's important to make sure that her estrogen replacement is adequate um, from the point of view of libido. Uh, is she actually on sufficient estrogen? Sometimes around about this age, actually, as the estrogen levels drop even further, sometimes you do find you do actually need to increase the level of estrogen replacement a little bit. So it could be that if she's still got some vaginal dryness, again, she might benefit from some topical estrogen, um, or it might be uh, that that in addition with maybe increasing her, her um, systemic dose of estrogen dial might also help give her the benefit. Um, I do find in general with giving testosterone replacement, I, I do think it's the classic Marmite situation. I probably take as many women off it um, uh, as I start. In fact, I'd say I probably, um, there's probably more women I see that, that, that want to stop it um, than I see that, that actually want to start it. And I, I think my worry for this lady is she, she, she probably won't like the effects on her unwanted hair growth. Thank you, Lisa. Anybody else got any comments that they wanted to add in? Um, I mean, things about how long do you continue? Well, I would argue that if she's enjoying or she feels better with her HRT, um, that she, there's no reason why really why she should stop as long as she's paid attention to weight and, uh, and other lifestyle factors. But I know that that's not commonly what the, the DH and the MHRA would, arg uh, would advocate. But I think I would, I would argue that there, is a, there are two generations of women who've been denied the benefits of HRT since the Million Women's um, Initiative study came out uh, and the Million Women and, and the WHI study in 2003 and 2004. And I think it's a great pity. Um, there was another scare last year or 18 months ago, wasn't there, when the MHRA put out another alert about the problems of HRT and the estrogen component leading to a small but definite increase in the um, incidence of breast cancer. But of course, what I think that MHRA alert to general practitioners was very misleading because what they failed to tell you in it was that there's no increase in mortality uh, from those cases because they were all very early cases uh, and all treated uh, um, and now this could be cured uh, if caught at an early stage. So I think there's a lot of polarized thinking about HRT, but I do think it's important that you give the woman the choice of weighing up what's best for her. And it may well be that in this woman, she feels that her risks uh, from um, osteoporosis or fracture um, and becoming um, to becoming dependent and frail, uh, at which the HRT can help her offset for a bit longer. And also some of the cardiovascular benefits which are particularly noticed, of course, in women who start um, estrogen replacement uh, around the time of the menopause, as opposed to or a long way past the actual menopause, i.e. cessation of periods. So lots of things to say. Marilyn's got her finger up, I think. Please come on oh, in. I was, I was just going to comment because I can see there's a typed question from Timrat about um, uh, alternative therapies. And I was just going to highlight, because it's I, I, the point about HRT and the fact that we've all been scared by it is important, but we probably also need to remember that it is not suitable for everybody. There are clearly some people for whom they don't want it. There are some people for whom there are relative contraindications, and there are some for whom there are genuine contraindications that mean they really can't have um, estrogen therapy. And one of the questions then was about things like black cohosh or phytoestrogens, for which um, there is a perception that these will be both helpful and safer. And of course, there is no reason to suppose that they're safer, they're estrogenic. So if there is an estrogen receptor reason why somebody shouldn't take estrogen replacement, then phytoestrogens fall into that category too. And uh, absence of evidence isn't the same as evidence of absence. And just because there's not been a million women trial of black cohosh in which a small signal of lack of safety turns up doesn't mean I think that we can reassure women that it's perfectly safe. It just means nobody's looked. 
Thank you. Thank you. As you say, the lack of evidence is not evidence that there's no, it's lacking. It's, it's really very important. Um, Simrat, have you got any other questions that you'd like to pose to our, our lovely panellists? So I do have one, but before I um, before I give you my question, uh, we have another question um, from one of the participants. So going back to the case, um, he said, is there a case for ultrasound pelvis and um, and looking and doing some imaging of the adrenals as well? So I'll, I'll answer that if that's all right. And I think I would not do that on the basis of what we have on this case. I think that that requires a, going back into the history in a great deal more detail, both in terms of chronology and in terms of severity. And if it looks like either of those cases are answered, I will give you the traditional endocrinologist's answer, which is it's biochemistry before localization. So I'd certainly look at the hormone levels first. There's a pretty high proportion of people who have an incidental finding of a, of a lump on their adrenal gland. And there, there are more as we get older. It's, it's not uncommon as we get older for 5% of people to turn up with what may well be an adenoma and it may, be, may well be non-functional on the adrenal. And if you pick up a lump in the absence of knowing what kind of biochemistry you're trying to tie into it, um, you can end up tied up in knots about it. So I think I wouldn't, I wouldn't jump in and do imaging. I'd think carefully about the history, the physical examination and the biochemistry first. Thank you. Thank you. Really very practical points. Simrat, over to you. And I think I think just because of COVID and this climate that we've all been living in, I'm going to ask a, a very open-ended question to all of you. So chip in and just give me your thoughts and, and experience on this. So I've seen people coming in with all sorts of things, heavier periods, premenstrual pains, aches, completely debilitated post-COVID. Um, and their cycles completely changing. In your experience and in your areas, and if, if we take the menopause, for example, have you seen any changes um, or anything that strikes you as, wow, this person's had COVID and, um, and you know, this is, this is new. We haven't seen this before. Well, the others can, can chip in there. I mean, I was going to say, and I don't mean to sound flippant in any way, but of course, remember, I'm working in a teaching hospital where we've been unable to do the general gynecology. So I think Simrat, you and Rupal have been doing our work for us um, for the large part of this, this last year, because we've not been able to do general gynecology for patients that haven't got emergency situations. So yes, I've seen some people in my practice at, um, at the Linda Wing and it's at, at the one Welbeck, but I haven't seen a large number of that. But as we're starting to open up, Again, I think we're going to be seeing more and more, um, but thank you for looking after them whilst we've been so much shut down in, in, in the acute sector. Um, Lisa, do you want to make a comment about that? And then we go over to our gastroenterologist as well. Yes, I don't think I've seen more women with um, uh, perimenopausal symptoms, um, but one of the things that has really struck me during um, lockdown is how many women with what, what you could consider to be an anxiety disorder that has led to functional hypothalamic amenorrhea have actually got better during um, lockdown. And I find that, first of all, quite surprising. And this is, this is anecdotal. I, I can't give you any, any, any numbers, but this is um, sort of certainly in, in our department at, at, at Imperial, what, one of the things we've noticed over really the last two or three years is that the, the, the prevalence of functional hypothalamic amenorrhea seems to have increased. And I think that that's because it's, there's been a sort of a bit of an explosion of anxiety amongst um, uh, teenagers and, and young people. Um, but what struck me during lockdown is that because people have been forced to be at home um, and there seems to have been a, um, less of a need to present uh, you know, the bright smiley face and the less of a need to put on your makeup and go out there into the world and, and less of a, a FOMO, less of fear of missing out, um, that I've, I've had quite a number of women who have commented to me that actually they feel a lot less stressed and perhaps they're feeling a bit more cocooned by being within their own environment. And I just wonder what's going to happen next, whether we're going to see a little bit more of the anxiety um, rearing its head as people who've got adjusted to staying at home um, and having a fairly limited 
limited life, but not worrying about it because that's what everybody else is doing. I wonder, I worry a bit about what's going to happen next. And it's interesting that here we are today on the 8th of March, which is the day that a lot of the schools have gone back. And there's been quite a lot um, uh, put out there. It's been coming from schools themselves. It's been on, in, in, in all the news broadcasts. Um, a little bit of a worry about how are our young people and children going to be coping with the return to the classroom and everything that that brings. So I'd say possibly the, the opposite way around to what you might have thought. Thank you. And from the GI perspective, Anna and Lisa, have you noticed any changes in presentation or prevalence or whatever during COVID? In your practice? It's been really interesting. We, we, we've been very much like you, Leslie. We, we've not, you know, we were, many of us were seconded onto COVID wards, so we weren't, we haven't managed to keep up our endoscopy workload. So we certainly know data that we have diagnosed 75% less colorectal cancers in the last year than expected. So we know there are patients out there with colorectal cancer that have not come through. And the next year coming forward, that's going to be, you know, we are all going to have to work really closely with our GP colleagues in order to try and filter out those patients uh, who really have got the highest risk, you know, using a uh, QFIT testing just to try and bring them through and diagnose them. In terms of the functional symptoms, it's been really interesting. It's been fairly polarizing. There have been patients whose symptoms have got significantly worse, the sort of general IBS, lethargy, fog-like symptoms. And they tend to be patients who've not coped very well with the, with the general psychology surrounding the COVID lockdown. They've either lived alone and had no general support. On the other hand, a lot of my patients, particularly suffering with urgency and urgent continence, have found it much easier being at home because, of course, they don't have to rush. They don't have to go on a public transport. They don't have the worry. And, you know, and, and they've all said to me, it's funny when I'm at home, I just don't feel the, uh, the urgency. And of course, this goes back to what I was saying earlier, the link between gut and brain, which is so inexorably linked. That of course, once you start worrying that you're not going to make it to the toilet, you won't make it to the toilet. And going back to our case about some of the things that Lucy and other biofeedback practitioners do with our patients is practicing deferral of urgency. So we all know that you can try and control your uh, symptoms of urgency of going into vacation. So I suppose from my point of view, it's been sort of two ways, but underlying all of that really worry about undiagnosed colorectal cancer patients. I don't manage hepatology, I don't do liver function tests, but of course we know they've been sort of side effects of long COVID, liver function test abnormality, very prevalent in hospitalized COVID patients. It's been really tricky to work out how to follow them long-term, et cetera. Most of the abnormalities resolve, but of course I think GPs have been left with sort of having to check these before plugging them back into secondary care. Thank you very much, Lisa. I think similarly, 50-50 split between those people who are very happy to stay at home and don't have to commute and they're right next to their bathroom. Um, I think what I'm seeing in the last couple of weeks is more anxiety about, oh my God, when I go back to work, how am I going to deal with, with my symptoms? Um, so I think the functional symptoms have been, have been um, highlighted and downplayed. I think the other thing is I've seen more people with abnormal LFTs because of COVID curves and the weight gain. So there's been at least a five, six, seven kilogram weight gain in a lot of my patients. And they're coming in with slightly raised AST and ALT. So um, happily, most of them have an ultrasound showing just non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I think the other thing to note was that gut symptoms of diarrhea, abdominal pain were, were minimized for the first year of COVID. But I think we know a bit more about that now and about their long COVID symptoms going on. So we've learned a lot in this year, I think. We have, we have. So I think I'm going to bring the, this uh, webinar to a close. I want to thank all of our fabulous panelists. I want to thank Simrat and Rupal Patel for putting all of the questions together and guiding us through it. And I want to thank the audience for being with us this evening. And as I started off by saying, this is the start of our women's health group. Uh, at One Wellbeck. We don't want it to just be the sixth floor. We've already gone vertically, as you've heard, up to several other floors and down to tonight. And we hope that in future webinars or seminars, uh, we may even be able to meet in person sometime, uh, that we can tackle other topics. So my, my plea to the audience is, please, if you have things that you think will be useful to hear about, please, please tell us because we will be very happy to respond. So on that note, thank you very much, everybody, for all your contributions, for turning up and listening. Um, and good luck to all of the teams at One Welbeck, but particularly to this Women's Health Initiative, not just on the sixth floor, but also the vertically integrated group as well. So thank you to all my panellists. You've been absolutely fabulous this evening, and I think the audience have really got a flavour
for the wealth of expertise that they now have available to them uh, to refer patients to. So thank you, stay safe, keep well, and good night. <laughs>